Hello everybody and welcome to our webinar entitled Life Science Applications Using Novel Submicron Simultaneous IR and Raman Microscopy, a new paradigm in vibrational spectroscopy. Our main speaker today will be Professor Shi Jing Ching. He's a biomedical engineering professor at Boston University at the Photonic Center. And in terms of a quick bio, he has authored well over 230 peer-reviewed papers. Most notably, he is the co-inventor of CARS microscopy from his postdoctoral time with Sunny Chi at Purdue Uni. And he's also the winner of the prestigious Lippincott Award for his outstanding contributions to vibrational spectroscopy. And importantly for us, and hopefully importantly for you, he's also a pioneer in the field of OPTIR as applied to life science systems. And to introduce him and to give him a uh, to give you guys a, a basis for his talk, I'll be doing a short intro. Uh, my name is Dr. Mr. Vikandas. I'm the Director of Product Management at Photothermal Spectroscopy Corp. And I've been doing FTIR and Raman for well over 20 years now. I have a PhD in biotech applications of FTIR. And I've worked from industry, from in academia. I've done R&D, sales, uh, and more recently product management. And just over a year now, I've been at Photothermal Spectroscopy Corp. Today's outline, I'll give you a quick interest to who we are, Photothermal Spectroscopy Corp, PSC. I'll take you through some of the limitations, or I call it accepted limitations when it comes to uh, incumbent technologies such as FTIR and some of the emerging QCL microscopy tools. I'll give you uh, the fundamentals to optical uh, photothermal IR, OPTIR. And finally, I'll, I'll hand over to uh, Professor Cheng to do most of this talk. Photothermal Spectroscopy Corp is located in sunny Santa Barbara, California. And Photothermal Spectroscopy Corp, PSC, has pioneered the breakthrough technique of optical photothermal infrared OPTIR technology that eliminates key limitations of traditional infrared spectroscopy systems, providing submicron spatial resolution for the IR and transmission like. FTIR quality spectra in non-contact reflection mode. More recently, PSC has developed the world's first simultaneous infrared and Raman microscope and imaging system, providing IR and Raman data from the exact same spot at the exact same time, the exact same submicron spatial resolution. PSC vision is to enable the power of infrared spectroscopy to, to be applied to high value problems in industry and academia by the adoption of OPTIR. So infrared spectroscopy has been around for decades. Uh, it's quite a common tool. It's, a, I think it's considered a workhorse technique of most labs. And it's essentially the study of how infrared light interacts with matter. Inf molecules are unique in their, in their makeup, in their structure, and, and the types of uh, atoms within uh, that molecule. And infrared light excites specific vibrations within the bonds within that structure. So an infrared spectrum is actually quite unique. It's a fingerprint essentially for that molecule with various peaks belonging to a particular vibration. For example, CH, so our C double bond O carbonyl is quite unique. We have CH stretching vibrations that are also quite unique and NHOH stretches as well. And both FTIR or infrared microscopy and microscopy have been applied for decades across a whole range of application areas from polymers through to forensics through cultural and geosciences. But today, of course, we'll be focusing on its life science applications. Okay. But as I said, it is a mature technology. It's been around for a while, but there are some fundamental limits. And these really stem from the fundamental laws of physics and optics that you just can't push any further. So, Primarily, what that one is is limited spatial resolution. And since we're dealing with infrared wavelengths, uh, these are relatively long when you compare them to your visual wavelengths, which are in the many hundreds of nanometers. In the infrared, we're dealing with wavelengths that are typically sort of three to maybe 15 microns uh, in, in length, so it's 15,000 nanometers. Uh, to illustrate that, we've got a visible picture on the left-hand side of this uh, microscope target, an Air Force target. On the right-hand side, we have an infrared image of it, and the infrared image, of course, looks far more blurry. That's just fundamentals. Also, complex sample preparation can be an issue. 
uh, to get the best quality spectra out of an infrared system, you typically run in transmission mode. Uh, and you then need to cut things typically between 5 to 20 microns. Right? Well, not everything you can cut, and what you can cut is often difficult to cut. Right? So there's difficulties associated with cyber prep. To get around some of these issues, uh, more recently, people have been using ATR, ATR, attenuated total reflectance. Uh, that requires contact with the sample, though. It's a high refractive index germanium crystal, typically, that's in contact with the sample. You require pressure with the sample, so that means often denting, damaging, breaking the sample. Uh, there's risk of the crystal itself being damaged and broken and scratched, and they're quite expensive. And there's also risk of cross-contamination if you're doing multiple samples. That's another area of actually greater concern, especially when it comes to life science applications, are these so-called dispersive and scatter artifacts. And so let me try and illustrate what I mean by that. Uh, on the right, this upper right-hand corner, we have a very pretty spectrum of PMMA, polymethyl methacrylate, measured in thin as a thin film in transmission mode. And it's a perfect spectrum. It's flat, there's no baseline till, there's no offset, the peak shapes. Uh, nice and symmetric and, um, and, and as expected. However, if you take the exact same material, make that into a sphere, a bead, and measure that in transmission mode, well, things look very different. It's a, it's a spectrum of a 15 micron bead. Make that into a 10 micron bead, things look different yet again, and make it into a 5 micron bead, and things look even worse. So you can see how things get increasingly distorted with smaller beads. From this, our take home is really that your sample shape and size and surface roughness as well, can impact on the spectrum you get out of it. Even if the chemistry is the same, those other physical traits can influence and impact uh, the spectrum. Okay. Um, in these slides, I'll attempt to compare and contrast uh, regular traditional IR microscopy with Raman microscopy. And Raman is, 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 a, is a relative of Infrared, it's a complementary technique. They both probe vibrations, though they both typically probe different types of vibrations. So that's why they're often termed as very complementary techniques. Uh, but if you're in your experiment, if you're in your microscopic experiments, you care about spatial resolution, well, you'd be going down the path of Raman because Raman uses visible, typically visible excitation lasers and therefore can be focused very tightly because of their short wavelengths. Infrared, you can't. So all that loses out. However, Raman can lose out to fluorescence. Of course, infrared has no issues when it comes to fluorescence. Spectral sensitivity, the infrared is typically orders of magnitude more sensitive. It's therefore a faster measurement technique as well. Uh, the infrared is far more extensive in terms of, ava of, of available commercial spectral databases. It's often far more spectrally interpretable. It's kind of more spectrally rich. Um, in general, and therefore it wins out there. Uh, but if we care about working in an easy, practical reflection mode, sort of standoff, non-contact, well, that's where Raman will, will win out again. It's kind of point and shoot. You don't have to worry about subway prep, whereas you, know, you do with, with infrared. Water vapor fluctuations, well, that can be a huge issue with infrared, an absolute non-starter when it comes to Raman. Water solvent compatibility, which is very um, apt for our talk today about my science applications. Uh, Raman is perfectly fine for the infrared. It's, it's, it's incredibly impractical to work with water because of the required several micron, micron path lengths to make it impossible to work with. Glass substrate compatibility. Well, many biological samples are often on glass, and Raman works well. The infrared doesn't because glass is mostly opaque. It kind of blocks out two thirds of the important part of the spectrum uh, and spatial resolution being independent of the wavelength. So in the infrared, one end of the spectrum gives you better spatial resolution than the other. In the Raman, it's constant. Right. And so as you can see just from this graphic here that it's kind of split almost half-half. There are, uh, for some of the key drivers, IR is better and for the others, Raman is better. So this is why most labs will often have two systems. They'll have a Raman and they'll have an, have an infrared, depending on what's important, they'll pick one or the other. Well, if you could take the best of that and put it into one instrument, that's kind of what we've done here with this. So all of those key um, drivers here will all come up green when you, when you consider this as the OPTIR technique. 
so essentially, a PCR microscope, the Mirage microscope, combines the best of traditional IR and Raman into a single platform. Now, there are certain samples that will still require Rama. Certain uh, components and chemicals work best with Rama, uh, just based on their selection rules, their vibrational spectroscopic selection rules. Uh, and in that case, Rama spectroscopy can be added to this. And that's something that will also be touched on uh, during my part and more extensively in Professor Jing's part. Okay. So, what can we do with OPTI? As a summary, we can do submicron infrared. Just like Raman can, but with infrared information, we get FCI transmission like data in reflection mode with no distortions, no artifacts, no interference fringes, and that's an absolute biggie. Right? The data quality we get in reflection mode is, 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 is just like transmission. In fact, I, I haven't mentioned, but FTIRs and, and regular QCL or these emerging QCL techniques don't typically work in reflection mode, but if they do, they don't work very well in reflection mode. OPTI is non-contact, and as, as touched on before, the spatial resolution is infrared independent. Okay. So how does this OPTI magic almost seem to work? Well, I'll try to, I'll try to illustrate that here in a short video. So we've got a regular infrared objective, a reflective objective from which we shine which through we shine our infrared tunable uh, beam. Uh, the spot size is relatively broad because of the long, long wavelengths. At the same time, we shine through a visible probe light. It's much more tightly focused. It's a green, it's short, and we focus it tightly. And as we tune our infrared wavelengths, we get localized heating. That changes the reflection properties, and we measure, we measure the green reflectivity as a function of our infrared wavelength sweep. And from that, through some clever processing, we extract out what is essentially a pure absorbent spectrum, but collected in reflection mode. Now, I talk a lot here about reflection mode, but depending on the sample, in fact, a lot of these biological samples are often run in uh, transmission mode OPTR as well. And that's probably a lot of what Professor Ching will talk about in the uh, subsequent sections. Okay, so to summarize our capabilities, we can do point spectroscopy, we can do line arrays, we can do hyperspectral imaging, which is essentially a mapping mode. We can do high resolution imaging at a fixed wavelength or a series of fixed wavelengths. We can then ratio, ratio those two together. And also, as already touched on, the spectra collected are, comp are completely comparable to existing databases, whether they're internal or external commercial databases. An important, and another important point to note is perhaps some differences in terminology you might have seen or will see. Uh, we refer to this technique as OPTIR, optical photothermal infrared. Um, others, and Professor Cheng in the upcoming section of this talk, uh, will refer to this technique as MIP, mid infrared photothermal microscopy. So OPTIR and MIP are exactly the same techniques. Okay. Um, if, you, if you want to delve into a little bit more about perhaps how the uh, schematics work and the differences between FTIR and these emerging QCLs to what we do with OPTIR. Let's think about how a regular microscope here would work. We've got our infrared source that goes through the interferometer, it goes through a focusing objective, uh, it passes through the sample, and then the residual IR. Now I'm using the word residual here because the incident IR is absorbed. You get some absorption from the sample itself. You get various other losses as well. You get you'll get front surface reflection. There'll be scatter, diffuse scatter type losses, interference type losses, and what comes out the other, at the other end is your residual IR, and that gets detected and processed into a spectrum. So it's important to note though that that spectrum isn't just due to the absorbance absorbance profile of the sample. There are lots of other artifacts that are convoluted into that, and especially when it comes to large science applications. Things like me scatter, for example, that can be quite quite troublesome, really. Right. And in contrast, what we do with OPTR is actually far simpler. We simply monitor the green, the green reflectivity as a function of our infrared tune, or the tune of wavelengths. But what that means is that we only get a signal, we only get a response if there's an absorbance. If the sample doesn't have an absorbance at the particular wavelength, 
there is no response. So I consider this to be like a more pure, quote unquote, infrared absorbent spectrum delivery method. And key differentiators to perhaps consider here. I think we've already mentioned it's Raman-like in terms of its spatial resolution, yet with infrared information. Uh, it operates in reflection mode uh, without any of these dispersive uh, artifacts, no me scatter, no baseline assets, no tilts. Its point detector architecture means there aren't any coherence artifacts, there's no speckles in your, in your image, nor in your spectra. Uh, no need to microtome thin slices. Now I've seen people work on thick bone chunks uh, that just don't need to make them thin. Uh, you can work anywhere from about 100 nanometers of thickness to several millimeters of thickness. In fact, as long as you could fit it in, on the stage, and maximum there's about 16 millimeters. Right, so it's perfect for, perfect for those difficult to cut samples. Right. Thin sensitive to water vapor fluctuations. I mean, I've measured. Uh, many a biological sample where I've opened this front door, put my sample in, closed the lid, and commenced measurement. So there's no time to wait for the purge to stabilize, it's measured immediately. It works on glass and even other visibly transparent substrates, for example, plastic. And really, the, the basis for this is the fact that the infrared comes from the top, you interact with the sample, that photothermal sort of effect becomes encoded into the green. And once that's encoded into the green, that green is free to pass through glass, it's free to pass through clear plastic uh, to go on and be measured. So no need for expensive or fragile infrared transfer sub substrates. And perhaps most excitingly is the fact that we can use this green probe laser as a dual purpose laser. It's acting as a probe laser, but it also forms or can act as the excitation laser for Raman. What this means though is that we can get far more thorough sample characterization. We can use the full complementarity of infrared and RAM. In fact, I call this complementarity and confirmatory analysis because the IR confirms the RAM and vice versa. And at this point, I'd like to hand over to Professor Chen to continue on this section of his talk. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction, Mustafa. So today I'm going to present this mid infrared photothermal microscopy and the broad applications to life science and medicine. So why we do this? A current frontier and also grand challenge of life science is how to understand this molecule extra or how molecules work together inside a living system. If we can understand this molecule extra, then we can find target for precision diagnosis and treatment. However, it's very difficult to see molecules inside living cells. If we look into the current science, until very recently, bioimaging still largely rely on these labels. And here I give you three preeminent examples. The first one is Goji and Kasha invented this staining technique over a century ago. And this allow us to see the structure of the nervous system. Today, this technique has been used to do uh, histology and many other purposes. A second example is the invention of fluorescent proteins, which allowed us to visualize protein dynamics in a living cell. And the most recent example is a super resolution fluorescent microscopy, which allowed us to visualize biological structures on a nanoscale matter. So these are really powerful tools. However, the labeling approach does not answer all the questions. For example, labeling does not have the capacity of discover unknown markers or species. Also, these fluorescent proteins cannot be translated to human tissue because we cannot do transfection on human patient. Also, perturbation to small molecules is a big concern in the labeling approach. So we ask a very fundamental question here is, can we see molecules in cells and tissues without labeling? Can we use intrinsic signal molecules to visualize molecules? A new field called a chemical microscopy, which is based on this fingerprint molecule vibrations is now rising to fulfill this unmanned lead. In principle, every molecule has their fingerprints based on the 
chemical bond vibrations. So if we can use this fingerprint as a contrast, we can visualize different molecules inside a living cell, an algorithm, or a tissue. So in this review in science, we have shown uh, various examples in C. elegans, uh, protein synthesis in living cells, and label-free detection of skin cancer, plague in heart disease, and brain cancer margin. Vibration spectroscopy can be recorded by Rama scattering. Rama is, however, a very slow process. And to overcome this limitation, coherent Rama scattering has been developed. This microscopy has been developed and used for high-speed vibration imaging. So this is called a CARS and the stimulant Rama scattering. So my group and also other groups have been developing this technique called the coherent Rama scattering microscopy for almost 20 years. And this has a lot of applications. For example, we can directly apply this technique to study human patient specimen and make a discovery of biomarkers for uh, precision diagnosis and treatment. One example is that through uh, this Rama spectroscopy of lipid in prostate cancer, we found that cholesterol ester is a marker for aggressive risk in human prostate cancer. Another example is that uh, we found another marker for cancer stem cell in ovarian cancer. So this uh, CC double bond CH stretching shows that lipid unsaturation is increased in ovarian cancer stem cell. So this tells a clear message here that is that the label-free vibrational spectroscopy imaging is a translational and it can be used to make a discovery through study of patient specimen. However, we still have limitations. A fundamental limit is that the Roma cross-section is a very weak process. So because it's a very weak process, the, S, the CAS or SRS imaging sensitivity is eventually limited to a minimal level for natural molecules or natural chemical bond. So here we're using the DMSO as example, it's about 10 minimal. So such efficiency or sensitivity is not sufficient to visualize biomolecule at the low concentrations. In particular, Rama signal in the fingerprint is even weaker. So a few years ago, we come to a spot that we should think out of this Rama box. So what's outside of this Rama scary? There we have infrared absorption which provides similar information of vibrational spectroscopy, but with a cross-section that is one million times bigger than Rama scattering. So this uh, thought drove my group into the new field of IR spectroscopy and imaging a few years ago. And when we go there, we found that this is even a, a field as large as Rama spectroscopy. In particular, it has a longer history since this Koblenz published this database of IR spectroscopy in 1905. And in recent two decades, we can find that these inventions that allowed IR imaging. So one is a focal plane array for direct FTIR microscopy, the quantum cascade laser for high-speed IR imaging at the specific vibrational frequency. Direct IR imaging, however, has its own limitation. First, the spatial resolution is poor. Even at the diffraction limit, the spatial resolution is a few micron. And that resolution is not sufficient to visualize structures inside a cell. What's more, in FDIR imaging, or this quantum cascade laser-based IR imaging, there's a strong water absorption which inhibits the use of this technique to study living cells for functional analysis of molecules. The synchrotron source has been used to improve the resolution to two micron, However, this source is not available to most labs, and still it can only be used to study dried samples. In 1990s, there's a big invention called AFM IR. So this is using AFM tip to measure the IR absorption, and it improves the spatial resolution to nanoscale. So these are very powerful tools for films, but still it is not applicable to study molecules inside the living cell. A few years ago, my group started to think about this barrier, and we come up with a new approach called IR excitation and the visible beam probing. So our idea is that the IR spectroscopy will cause a absorption and the subsequent local change of the refracting index around the subject that we are studying, like a cell or a bacterium. 
then we apply a visible beam to measure this change. So how we measure the refract index? In this first paper we published in Science Advance, we use a dark field geometry to prove this is dancing effect. In theory, the intensity change of the visible beam is proportional to the number of molecules in the focus and also proportional to the refract index change. I would mention that other groups have worked on this using a different approach, including Michelle Sand at BU, Greg Hunnant at Notre Dame, and Lee in Korea. In our approach, we used quantum cascade laser, which is a pulse to induce this uh, impulsive or pulsed infrared absorption. Then we're using a visible beam, which is here is simply LED to measure this photothermal effect. So by doing this, we have achieved a resolution of 0.6 micron in this first paper and a sensitivity of 10 micromole for a chemical bond in fingerprint region. Our first mid-infrared photothermal microscope was built at the Purdue, where I was a faculty in the biomedical engineering. As you can see here that uh, this whole system is highly compact and also cost effective because the major laser source is a quantum cascade laser and the detection is based on LED. So it's much smaller compared to the CARS and SI system in my lab. So we were very excited that, that to see that the uh, potential of this technology. But there are a few innovations in this system. So one is that we ask the question, what is the optimal modulation of the IR uh, laser? And we did a signal ratio along different frequency and we found that around 100 kilohertz can give the best signal ratio in our system. We then built the circuits because this is resonant amplifier and have very high Q value near our uh, this modulation frequency. So these circuits can only amplify the photothermal signal, which is modulated at the same frequency. Then we use a lock-in to detect this amplifier signal. So this improves the signal ratio by 500 times, which allow us to do high sensitivity infrared photothermal imaging. The beauty of this approach is that it provides exactly the same information as FTIR spectroscopy. As you can see here, to compare two samples, one is polystyrene film and the other is olive oil. So one is solid and the other is liquid. You can see that the peak position appears at the exact same position. And if we look more carefully, the photosymbol, or here we call it MIP, have an even better line shape than FDIR. This is because IR photothermal is a background free technique. The signal only appears when there is absorption. IR photothermal is a pump probe technique. The pump with IR and the probe with a visual beam. So in theory, it has a linear power dependence as proved here. There's a linear on the pump power and linear dependence on the probe power. So this also gives the technique the sectioning capability. It has a depth resolution which is not available in FTIR spectroscopy. We use the CO bond to evaluate the imaging sensitivity and we can reach 10 micromolar as the sensitivity limit. We then apply this technique to image chemical bonds in a living cell. In this case is a live cross-cancer PC3 cell growing in the calcium fluoride dish. We tune to the CO bond at the 1750 wave number so this is to visualize the ester bond in lipid and in the membrane. So we can see here that the, we really can see details inside this single cell, which is about 10 micron. This is not possible with FDIR or direct IR imaging because the IR spot is as big as the cell. But here, because we use a visual beam, so the focus of the probe beam is much smaller than the IR beam. And this resolution is from the thermal confinement because the thermal effect is confined to the objects inside living cells and it quickly cool down by the water surrounding the object. So in this case, we can get the diffraction limit resolution, which is about a 600 nanometer defined by the visible probe beam. We can apply this to site tissues and even organisms. So this is the image of C. elegans. 
we tune to the CO bound to see the lipid droplets of fat stored in C. elegans. So here we also achieved a spatial resolution of about 600 nanometer. And because this is a chemical microscopy, if we tune to the other bonds, we will see other molecules. So for example, we tune the amino one band, we will see the protein in the C. elegans. And if we go to water, so we will see the, the water surrounding the, the surrounding medium. Using this system, we also measure the, the depths. We can go as deep as 80 micron and still see the contrast in this C. elegans uh, system. So some samples are opaque, non-transparent. For example, drug tablets. So we ask that can we do IR photothermal on these tablets? So for that purpose, we build an EPI, MIP system. So here the both beams shine to these tablets and the IR absorption induces a thermal effect. And the visible beam measures this photothermal impact effect and bounce back by the sample and uh, through the beam splitter, which is a polarization beam splitter, and sent to the flow diode. Here, if you note that uh, before the beam splitter, there is a quarter wave plate. So we're using this polarization difference to separate the signal from the excitation beam. As you can see here, that we really can get very good high resolution images of the drug and these other components, excipients in these Tylenol tablets. And this was done in the contact-free mode. So if you have other laser source, for example, if you have a femtosecond laser source being used to cast SIS microscopy, you can also do IR photothermal imaging simply by adding a crystal to produce this different frequency generation. So, so here we prove that we can produce the IR beam and by using a pair of chirped femtosecond pulse, we can tune the IR frequency simply by tuning the delay between the two pulse. And this in principle can go to any frequency in the IR window. So here we tune to this CD range, which is around 2100 wave number. And uh, we use this to image the CD bond in the, as a study, uh, proof of concept of cancer metabolism study. So we published this paper in September 2016. And I remember that uh, in the same month, I gave a presentation at the SIEX meeting. So after my talk, Roshan Shetty, at that time he was the CEO of Enesis. So he came to me and asked me that whether he can commercialize this technique for broader use by non-experts. He was very fast. In 10 months, Mirage appeared. So first by analysis, then after analysis was purchased by Brooker, a new company was formed called the Photothermal Spectroscopy Corp by Roshan and his colleagues. So this Mirage can do sub-micron resolution IR spectroscopy using the photothermal principle. If we look at this diagram, it shows that the advantage of this approach, it fills the gap between FDIR and AFM IR. FDIR has a resolution of 10 micron and can only study dried specimen. AFMR has a nano scale, but it can only be used for very flat film samples. Our method is contact free. It provides sub micron spatial resolution and can zoom into the sample, provides three dimensional information. What's more, a beauty of this system is that we can couple IR photothermal imaging and the Raman spectroscopy on the same platform because we can using the visible beam as an excitation source for Raman spectroscopy. So in this case, we can do IR photothermal spectroscopy imaging and the Raman spectroscopy at the same spatial resolution. Or we can do IR guarded because IR can imaging can be done at a specific vibrational frequency to see the subject. In this case is the polymer beads. Then we can do Raman spectrum on that pixel of interest. So we believe that this is a very powerful tool. This is, I believe, is the first time that IR spectroscopy and Raman spectroscopy 
are integrated on a single instrument and provides the same spatial resolution. So this was a collaboration between a photothermal spectroscopic cope and my group, and it was funded by a SBR grant from NIH. A few weeks ago, we published a paper in Analytical Chemistry to show some details of this technique. In our paper, we actually use a counter propagation beam geometry. And this provides even better spatial resolution because we're using the high NL objective to focus the visible beam into the sample. And because this high NL objective, we now have achieved a spatial resolution of 300 nanometer. And we can do a high quality data from a single bacterium and get both fingerprints of IR photothermal spectroscopy and IR guided Raman spectroscopy. This technique, as you can see here, the sample is quite special. So it's a sandwich. The top is a calcium fluoride, which passes the IR. And the bottom is a Raman grade quartz, which allowed high quantity Raman spectroscopy. The sample, which can be alive, is placed between these two uh, glass windows. Okay, so it seems that we have everything, but there are always challenges. I haven't shown you this picture of doing this IR photothermal microscopy. But if you look carefully, that uh, this picture shows some limitations. So why is that uh, there's a focus mismatch? the visible focus is much smaller than the IR focus. So this is a principle that we achieve, we break the diffraction limit of IR image. Right? But for the same reason, it tells us that the most IR energy is not used. We use, only use the middle part of the IR focus. Another thing is that, uh, so here we scan the sample and to move to the next pixel, we had to wait until the, this thermal decay is finished. So this limits the pixel dwell time to tens of microseconds. But well, this is very fast, but we want to be faster and we want to fully utilize the IR energy. So how to achieve that? We recently have a new uh, IP that is doing a wide field excitation and detection. So in this case, because of wide field, we can manipulate the focal size so that the IR focus and the visible beam focus are matched in size. As you can see here, we're using a counter beam propagation. The IR from the bottom, the visible from the top, and we measure this in the back reflection mode. So if you ignore the IR part, this is essentially a interference microscope, or people call it ISCAT, which allow very sensitive detection. But here we actually, by using IR beam, we add chemical information to this interference microscope. So this would allow high speed chemical imaging, as I will show you in the next few slides. But a elevation here that the substrate that you can see is contains a, is a silicon. So silicon is a very unique. Number one, silicon is transparent in the IR. And number two, silicon provides a very large refraction index, which makes sure that a big, a sufficient amount of visible photons is reflect back to the CMOS camera. So the, our idea is a major refraction change induced by IR absorption, we measure two states. One is cold, IR off. The other hot, IR on. And the difference between these two states give the chemical map. But to do this, we still need elevations in the instrumentation. So we need a camera to measure this difference between hot and cold in real time. And we call this camera virtual lock-in camera because it's like we do this uh, locking detection in the scanning mode, but now is a camera mode. So why I call it a virtual? Because this is not a real locking camera. It's just a common CMOS camera we used for many other purposes. But what we did here is that we synchronized the excitation, the probing 
and the camera capture all together electronically using the IR laser as a clock. So these advanced electronic systems allow us to take this measure on and off uh, in real time. So this is a collaboration with my former colleague Ali Shakuri at Purdue. He was an inventor of this locking camera for other purposes. As you can see here that uh, this is timing in the virtual locking camera. We basically have the, the camera capture is at a kilohertz, but our pulse is the representation rate is 100 kilohertz. So at each frame, we have many pulses, many pair of pump probe pulses. The only difference is that uh, in the hot frame, pump and the probe are both on. In the cold frame, we only measure probe, the pump is off. And at each frame, we average many of these pump probe pairs to get a image, right? So here we show you a example hot and a cold frame and difference give you the IR induced this uh, absorption, which the, the bright spot is IR focus in this case. We have achieved a detection sensitivity of 10 to minus three. So that is 0.1% change in this case. A beauty of this method is that uh, so this subtraction, the fringes and other background are removed. The only thing left is IR induced this absorption. So this is also a background free uh, chemical imaging method. So even this wide field modality, we still can see spectrum modality with FTIR spectroscopy. And this is a movie show you that we can visualize this IR excitation and quenching process in, in real time. So what this nanoscale thing film, we have a decay constant of 1.1 microsecond. So this shows you also the temporal resolution of our technique, because here the temporal resolution is determined by the width of the probing, which in our case is on the nanosecond scale. So now the speed in principle is only limited by the camera frame rate. The camera we use is 2,500 frames per second. And if we, we have to measure hot, hot and cold to generate chemical frame, so the limit here is 1,250 frames per second. This is a record of chemical imaging of all the methods. This is the fastest chemical imaging results. Because this is a nanoscale film, we have to uh, average a few. So we can get a very high contrast at the speed of 50 frames per second. So this is still uh, very fast. This wide field mode could potentially improve the support and allow large area tissue chemical image with biomarker information and with submicron spatial resolution. Okay, we uh, made a pattern called MIP to prove that we still have sub-micron spatial resolution in the wide field mode. So here the resolution is about 500 nanometer determined by this uh, intensity profile, as you can see here. So we have two uh, examples to prove that this wide field photosomal IR can do living cancer cells. So here you show that we can tune to the leopard, tune to the protein, and you tune off the cigarette gun. So this can be used for single cell analysis. And it also have the sensitivity to see nanoparticles. So here is a very clear image of 500 nanometer PMM beads. And now we can do 200 nanometer. So this also have a potential for single nanoparticle analysis. The IR photosomal spectroscopy and microscopy is still in the very early stage, but compared to CARS and SIs, this is only a, a few years old. But this technique, in my view, has broad biomedical application potential. Especially in the fingerprint range, we can study drug molecules, 
nucleases, protein, carbonyl bond. This gives very strong Rom uh, IR signal. And CD bond also give have a very big IR absorption cross section. And even we go to high wave number, we go to OH stretch, there we can study water and other molecules. Well, compared to Roma, which the cross section is big for high wave number CH vibration at the 2850, that a window. So that's why uh, lipids are widely studied by CARS and SIs. IR is the opposite. The IR absorption cross section, it depends on the uh, dipole of the bond. And the IR absorption cross section is much bigger in the fingerprint region. As you can see in the figure, the M1 band at the 1647, the M2 band at the 1548, all give very strong signal. And also the phosphate, the 1084, this can be used to study nuclear acids. So in summary, IR and Roma, they are complementary. They are sensitive to different modes. And now we can do this IR thermal and also Roma spectroscopy on the same setup. So we now can open a bigger window to study various biological process or tissues. Here I just give you a few examples. In the first paper, we showed that uh, we can image drug molecules in the cells because drug has their own fingerprint. And because we can provide sub-micron resolution, we now can visualize drugs inside the cell. This was not possible with FDIR spectroscopy or direct IR imaging. As a second example, we now can use IR photothermal to fingerprint a single bacterium, as you can see in panel C here. So panel A is tuned to MN1 band, and panel B is off reference the signal is gone. So we first do high-speed IR imaging to see where is the bacterium. And at each individual bacterium, we can take a high-quality IR spectrum fingerprint. In contrast, if you do FDIR, you have to pick, we have to prepare a film, like huge amount, millions of bacteria to get the image. So overall, these are consistent. The IR photosome FDI are consistent. But because we now have a single bacterium sensitivity, it opens a lot of opportunities. For example, we can understand the heterogeneity between different bacteria in the culture. And second, we can measure their sensitivity to drugs, antibiotics, at a single bacterium level. So this would allow early detection or high speed, high throughput detection of this antimicrobial susceptibility or called AST, which is now a big unmanned need in biomedicine because doctors want to determine which antibiotics works best for a patient as early as they can. So we have some unpublished data showing that the, at the single bacterium level, the fingerprint will change in response to a drug based on, so here you can see the blue is controlled and the, the red is drug treated to these uh, antibiotics. So we believe that the, this kind of application would allow our technique eventually maybe even move into clinic at the, for a high speed, high soup chemical based diagnosis. So with this, I would summarize my presentation today. I have presented you this chemical imaging in middle infrared in the living cells. And this is based on infrared absorption and the novel detection of this uh, absorption by measuring the thermal lensing effect in the dark field beam geometry, the thermal reflectance in the white field geometry. We probably can also measure phase, which we I don't have time to present today. Also, one thing I present to you is that the, the integration of IR photothermal and Roma spectroscopy on a single platform. There are a number of potential applications like antimicrobial test, cell metabolism, polymer films as materials, 
chemical histology, uh, this is for tissue applications, and also drug distribution cells and tissues. We luckily are uh, funded by Edge through this uh, R1 grant called uh, from, uh, uh, GMS on focused technology development. We also have a number of small business grants in collaboration with the photothermal spectroscopy corp. So finally, I would acknowledge my groups. Uh, so this is a very new direction in my group and it's still growing. My lab is located in Boston University Photonic Center. Uh, please stop by when you are in Boston. And also I acknowledge the collaboration with uh, Photothermal Spectroscopy Corp, which allow this uh, development of this technique for use by non-experts. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, uh, Professor Cheng, for that uh, incredibly exciting talk. It's, it's hard not to get excited about um, what, what can be done today, but you know what the future holds is, is just infinitely, um, incredibly exciting. So uh, thanks for teaching me and, and, and hopefully teaching a lot of the audience uh, all that can be done uh, with these uh, photothermal-based techniques, or what you call MIP, what, uh, photo, what we at Photothermal call uh, OPTIR, Optical Photothermal Infrared. Considering how many questions are coming flooding in, um, I'll I'll throw some of them your way, Professor Ching, if I may. Uh, I'll start with this question. Um, is fluorescence an issue still for the Raman channel? Uh, and also, how does it affect the infrared channel? That is a very good question. I think a fluorescence is there for the Raman channel, and that can be, uh, you know, we, we can use a longer wavelength to reduce the auto fluorescence. But fluorescence is not there in the IR channel. The reason is that the, the IR only measures the, the photothermal effect. So we measure the visual beam at on and off, and the difference only measures IR absorption. So that's the beauty of the IR photothermal uh, method. Thank you. Um, next question is, from the pictures of your instrument, it, it appears to be quite an open design. How do you handle water vapor and how does it compare to traditional FTIR? That's a very good question. Yes, the, if, we, uh, if, if the system is open, then the water vapor there will impact the IR, the, the IR beam intensity at the sample. In our method, you don't see much the water absorption because IR photosymmetry is a background free technique. So you don't see the, the water absorption in the spectroscopy. Of course, in order to do very precise measurement, we build a box and the flow of the nitrogen into the box, so that it can be done easily. Okay, um, it says uh, you've shown some very impressive results on cells. Have you attempted any measurements on tissues and, and how would this work on tissues on, on glass as there'd be millions of those in, in uh, tissue databanks? Indeed, we are working on that. So as I mentioned that uh, one of the big use of this technique is to perform chemical histology at a sub-micron spatial resolution. So we are working on this using our wide field uh, IR photosymmetry technique. And we have some preliminary results which I don't have time to show today. But the beauty is that we, uh, our technique, because we're using a counter beam, geom counter beam propagation geometry, the IR is from top and the visible is from the other side. So the IR can directly shine into the tissue on the cover slides, and we measure the refraction of the visible beam from the, the other side. So this is very nice because then we can use uh, the samples from tissue bank, which are mounted on cover glass to do this experiment. I would imagine that this is not visible with the conventional FDIR spectroscopy. Okay, thank you. Um, how is it that water does not seem to affect this technique as much as regular FTIR or at least direct QCL techniques? That's a very good question. In uh, FTIR or QCL based IR is IR in and IR out, right? So in principle, if the tissue is grown in the water medium, 
we cannot get any signal. So that's the reason we have to draw the sample to do the FDIR or direct QCL based IR spectroscopy. In our case, is IR in and visible out. So as long as the cells is very close to the bottom of the dish or the, the culture, the IR photons can reach the cells and induce the photothermal effect. And the visible beam can measure this uh, photothermal effect, uh, this refracting index change. And this can be done in the refraction mode or in the transmission mode. Uh, another beauty of this technique is that we can do in situ measurement using a refraction mode. So this was not possible with FDIR because IR photons are all absorbed, but the visible photons can bounce back. So in principle, this technique can even be used to image, to study like a human skin that uh, using the refraction mode to do a uh, in vivo measurement. Okay, this next one, this next one is probably related. I think it's from the same person. Um, when working in water, what sorts of path lengths can you handle? Uh, or, or is there an ideal water path length for this approach? You mean the depths? How the, the path length of, of, of water, I think they're referring to. Oh, yeah. So that's a, that's a, very, good, that's a very good question. That, uh, so this depends on the, uh, the wavelength used. Of course, if you tune to water absorption, then there's only a few microns we can probe. But if you tune off the water absorption, which is OH vibration at the 3200 wave number, right? If we go to fingerprint that uh, away from water absorption, we can go into a sample. The IR can go into tens of micron into a sample, and we still can see a very clear contrast. So in that case, this technique can be used to study single cells, thin tissues, and all even small algorithms like C elegance, we can get a very good con IR photothermal contrast. Okay, this one will have to be the uh, last one. Um, it says with, um, with, with regular FTIR or Q-cell techniques, uh, often in life science, cells and tissues uh, suffer from scatter artifacts like me scattering. Uh, mm -hmm. Is this an issue with this technique? I don't think a scattering is a big issue because we we scan the uh, so the spectroscopy is done by using the exactly the same visible laser right and by tuning the IR laser so if there is a scattering to the visual beam it's always fixed because we don't tune the wavelengths of the scattering of the visual beam. And so the spectroscopy was done by tuning the IR and IR, the scattering to the IR beam is not that significant. So that, that's the reason that we can get the actually high quality spectroscopy in the fingerprint from the biological sample. Okay, Professor Cheng, I think we're about to uh, run out of time. Once again, I, I thank you uh, for taking the time out um, to come along and, and give us this enthralling webinar. I also thank all of our listeners for taking time out of your valuable day to come and hopefully learn something new and, and hopefully uh, generate some 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 ideas from your end as well. Uh, and with that, I wish you all a good day and goodbye. Thank you.